Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another history video. We're in my search for something aptly spooky to cover for Halloween month, I came across the New England Vampire Panic, something that I've surprisingly never heard about before. This is a really interesting story and explains a lot about how we view vampires in our culture today. I know for Halloween I usually do a whole week of videos in Mystery Week, a few of you have been asking about it, but I'm sorry to say that I'm not actually going to be doing that this year as I am moving house the week before, and at this point I'm not even sure if I'm going to have internet connection which might make it all just a little bit difficult to get videos up. I'm not actually sure if I'm going to be able to get any videos up at all over that time period, it all depends how stressful it is, how easy the move is, how my internet connection is, so just bear with me for a few weeks, I will be back. But first I want to share with you this week's sponsor, Fatal Vows on CBS Reality, a series that traces the deadly and tragic path from I do to you're dead in 13 stories of marriages beyond repair. The series uses personal interviews, family photos, expert commentary and dramatic reenactments to understand how the relationships deteriorate so tragically. Each episode profiles a closed murder case associated with a couple's divorce, told objectively from different sides, using court documents, public archives, stock footage and interviews with lawyers and family members, as well as dramatic recreations based off the public documents. New episodes of Fatal Vows as every Thursday and Friday at 10pm on CBS Reality, which you can watch on Sky, Freeview, Virgin and Freesat. Now, if history tells us anything, it's that the people of New England love hysteria. That's the most northeastern states in the USA, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island and Connecticut. More than 200 years after the Salem witch trials, they were struck with another fear, vampires. They were also struck with tuberculosis, as I'm sure you'll come to see, is directly related. In the late 18th century to the early 19th century, New England was plagued with tuberculosis, which back then was known more commonly as consumption. It was so rife that this so-called White Plague actually went on to kill 2% of New England's total population and was the cause of 25% of all deaths. It was incredibly contagious and would easily kill off entire families. Only of course, back then at this time, germ theory wasn't much of a thing. Miasma, the theory that bad air caused diseases, was the more prevailing thought. People, even doctors, couldn't explain how consumption spread, or why it would finish off whole families in such a cruel and painful way. Nowadays, we know that it's a bacterial infection that spread through inhaling tiny droplets in the coughs or sneezes of an infected person, and can be cured if treated with the right antibiotics. Regardless, even now it is deemed as a serious condition, so people in the late 18th century had very little chance of survival. With no actual cure, victims in New England were often just sent to a sanatorium, these rest-orientated treatment centres in milder climates, until their symptoms subsided, if they did, not to be confused with sanitariums. Once you caught tuberculosis or consumption, you would either eventually recover, you would have a long painful illness over the course of a few years before dying, or you would simply die in a matter of months from the faster form of the disease. And even if you were one of the lucky ones who did recover, the bacteria would remain in the body as the latent form of TB, which could always return in full force at a later date. Whilst other illnesses such as cholera, plague, smallpox, influenza tended to come along in quick epidemics and then would disappear for a while whilst immunities kicked in, tuberculosis would not. It just hung around, they couldn't seem to get rid of it. The symptoms of tuberculosis, according to the NHS, include a persistent phlegmy cough that lasts more than three weeks, weight loss, night sweats, high temperatures, tiredness and fatigue, a loss of appetite and swellings in the neck. It was called the white plague because of how pale it would make people and the weight loss, you would just waste away. It would cause sunken eyes and cheeks, a skeletal appearance. These symptoms tending to mimic what we think of as characteristics of vampires today, pale, sunken. In fact, it seemed like somebody was just sucking the life right out of the victims. The death toll scene from tuberculosis was terrifying and the way they died was horrific. Once infected with tuberculosis, it would take a number of days to show symptoms, by which time you've already infected your entire family. But of course, this was a time when physicians were entirely unable to explain how diseases spread, and therefore rumours and theories began to fly. You've got to remember that this was a time when disease was completely unexplainable, it was all a mystery. And often the explanation that most people settled on 
was to do with the supernatural. And for a bit more context on this, we need to remember that the first settlers arrived in North America just a couple of centuries earlier, traveling over from Europe. New England was full of endless dark forests and there was a constant threat of native people emerging from these forests to claim their land back. The forest was something to be feared, holding unexplainable supernatural secrets, demons, witches. These settlers brought across their superstitions and their supernatural fears from the towns and villages of Europe. Eastern European folklore of creatures rising from the dead to feed on the blood of the living had spread across the continent and had therefore travelled over with the people to North America. This blood-sucking creature was known as the vampire, and it wasn't just folklore or rumour, it was something that was apparently very real and terrifying, this ever imminent threat. There's a reputation of New England being a particularly religious place, Puritan, the most Christian of the Christians, which it was back in the very early days, but by the 1800s particularly, New England was probably less Christian than the rest of the USA. Only about 10% of New Englanders belonged to the church at this point, according to the Smithsonian, and Rhode Island in particular was a very lax area. In fact, Christian missionaries were sent there from the more religious areas of the USA to save them. A lot of the time, supernatural belief comes directly from being religious, the devil sending all sorts of supernatural creatures to harm the living. But in New England, it suggested that religion wasn't so much the reason for this belief in vampires. It was all social and communal, rumours whispered from generation to generation of these blood-sucking creatures. But as time went on and the settlers spread out across America, this belief seemed to fade. Except for, of course, in New England, where it never really seemed to go anywhere. And when tuberculosis came along, which literally seemed to suck the life out of its victims, there was only one logical explanation vampires. One of the earliest examples of vampires being connected with tuberculosis was in 1784, when a New England newspaper published a letter about a foreign doctor who had apparently come up with a cure for consumption. The Johnson family from Willington, Connecticut had been suffering with the disease, and now a third member had contracted it. The doctor advised Isaac Johnson to dig up two family members who had already died of the illness and inspect their bodies for any sprouting plants. Apparently the Johnson family did this and they found sorrel. The doctor told the Johnson family to burn the sorrel with the vital organs of the dead to remove this sickness from the family. The person who wrote the letter to the newspaper was basically saying how it was an imposition. They didn't believe that this would work. But many people across New England with sick family members read this newspaper article and thought it could do no harm to try it and see if this worked for their own family. And this wasn't something that some random quack doctor would come up with on his own accord. There had been similar rituals across Eastern Europe for years. Another one of the earlier cases of New England vampirism was that of Rachel Harris from Manchester, Vermont. She died of tuberculosis in 1790, and a year later her widower, Captain Isaac Burton, married Rachel's stepsister, Holder. And then Holder also came down with consumption as well, and the only viable explanation was that Rachel was the one responsible from beyond the grave. So in February 1793, more than 500 residents of Manchester came out to watch Rachel be exhumed and her liver, heart and lungs be burned to ash. Burning her organs would stop her vampire spirit from sucking the life out of Holder, only of course it didn't work and Holder ended up dying that same September. You'd think that this would be proof enough to the residents that burning organs didn't work, but they just reasoned that it wasn't vampirism that killed Holder at all. Rachel was just a witch, they'd gone about it all wrong. Oh, to be living in New England in the 18th century. Depending on who you were, most people didn't actually believe vampires to be the reanimated corpses of their loved ones, literally rising from the dead to suck blood, Dracula style. They were more likely to believe that it was just the spirit of their loved ones returning. The spiritual connection that remained drained the life force of their loved ones, and the only way to break this spiritual vampire connection would be to kill the bodies once again. If a body was exhumed and liquid blood could still be found, or if it was better preserved than it was expected to be, this meant that the corpse was a vampire. But luckily, there are a number of things to be done to fix this. As with the case of Rachel Harris, you could burn the vital organs, or sometimes burn the entire corpse. Apparently, if you inhaled this smoke, that could make you extra immune to the vampire's powers. Or sometimes the ashes were consumed by family members suffering from tuberculosis. 
Sometimes a corpse would just be rearranged or turned upside down or flipped before it was reburied. If the corpse had decayed to just the point of being a skeleton, they would place the bones in a skull and crossbones pattern just to be safe before reburying it. It's easy to look back on this now with our understanding of illness and germ theory and laugh at how silly it all seems. Like, of course, we know now that this probably wouldn't work and we're all thinking that it's incredibly morbid. I mean, I couldn't think of anything worse than digging up my loved one's bodies and then just mutilating them a bit. But desperate times called for desperate measures. These were families who were losing each family member one by one, and you do get desperate. Imagine you're a father who slowly lost each of his children to a horrific and painful disease, watching them slowly waste away before your eyes. You can't understand why it's happening, and there's literally nothing you can do to help. When somebody suggests that it could be stopped by digging up the body of your late wife after the death of your second or third or fourth child, you might actually just consider doing it. Which is exactly what happened in the case of Mercy Brown. Mercy's case is considered to be one of the last of the New England vampire panic, and it's probably because of this that her case is one of the best documented cases of suspected vampirism. This happened in the late 19th century in Exeter in Rhode Island, where by the end of the century the population had dropped just 961 from more than 2,500 just 70 years earlier. A huge amount of that drop in population was down to consumption. The Brown family consisted of Mary Eliza and George Brown and their children, Mary Olive, Mercy and Edwin. There may have been more children, but these are just the ones involved in this particular story. In the early 1880s, Mary Eliza died of consumption, followed a year or so later by her eldest daughter, Mary Olive. By 1891, almost a decade later, Edwin had also contracted the disease. He sent to a sanatorium in a milder climate, Colorado, to fight it off, as was commonly done. It was pretty much the only treatment that had even the smallest effect. Just relax, rest, and hope you get better. Eventually, once he's feeling a bit better, he returns home and finds that his sister Mercy is also suffering. By January 1892, Mercy had died of tuberculosis aged just 19. She'd suffered with the galloping kind, fast moving and fast acting, but she may have been infected and asymptomatic for years. I mean, this was a decade after her mother had died from the same thing. And as Mercy was on the brink of dying, Edwin also took a turn for the worse after a brief time in remission. The local newspaper wrote of Edwin, if the good wishes and prayers of his many friends could be realised, friend Eddie would be speedily restored to perfect health. But prayers and good wishes were not enough and neighbours were scared for their own health. They approached George Brown, the father, and offered him a possible solution to Edwin's illness. They say that it might be caused by vampirism, this spiritual link with the undead, that his dead family members were sucking the life force out of Edwin. Now by this point of course we're coming to the end of the 1800s and a man called Robert Koch had actually identified the tuberculosis bacterium and germ theory was becoming more widely accepted. But news of this would not reach the rural areas for many years and if it did they certainly wouldn't have had much of an understanding of it. Although talks of vampirism had died out over the years, I mean it was over 100 years since the vampire panic of the late 1700s, the story had filtered down through the generations. Now the Brown family was being wiped out and the only explanation they could come to was a supernatural force. The neighbours asked George Brown for his permission to exhume the bodies of Mary Eliza, Mary Olive and Mercy. Reluctantly, not really knowing what else to do to save his son, George agrees. And on the 17th of March, 1892, a group of local men dig up the bodies as the Brown family doctor and a local journalist look on. George did not attend himself, he had only agreed to do it to shut his neighbours up, and he actually didn't believe in any of this. George Brown didn't believe in vampirism, and in his words, his neighbours were worrying the life out of him. As would be expected after a decade, the bodies of Mary Eliza and Mary Olive were little more than a few bones, with just a few patches of rotten flesh hanging on. But Mercy was weirdly well preserved. The journalist at the scene later wrote, the body was in a fairly well-preserved state. The heart and liver were removed and in cutting open the heart, clotted and decomposed blood was found. The doctor at the scene noted that Mercy's lungs showed diffused tuberculosis germs because he was a doctor and did have a deeper understanding of what was going on. But this didn't mean the locals would agree or understand what he was saying. The neighbours continued on with their mission and they burned Mercy's heart and liver on a rock and fed Edwin the ashes. 
It didn't work and he died anyway less than two months later. But the locals still believe that Mercy was a vampire. Why else would her body have been so well preserved? Well, now we can say it was probably because Mercy died in the midst of winter and her body was kept in a stone crypt at the back of the Chestnut Hill Cemetery for a couple of months before she was properly buried. It's now called the Shrub Hill Cemetery, just in case anyone local wants to go and take a visit. The weather conditions would have been perfect preservation, or at least for a slower decomposition. Mercy's story is so well known, so well documented, because even for the late 19th century, it was all very strange to people out of this small town outside of New England. Most communities had moved past believing in the supernatural. The late 1800s were full of social progress and huge leaps in scientific knowledge. The media caught hold of this very odd story and offered their own thoughts and opinions on this barbaric practice. There was even a writer for the London Post that said whatever was happening in America was a Yankee vampire and not a product of British folklore. A writer for the Boston Family Globe wrote that perhaps a frequent intermarriage of families in the backcountry districts may partially account for some of their characteristics. Incest. Incest was blamed. Not just superstition and fear, definitely incest. Rumour has it that the story of Mercy Brown even inspired Bram Stoker's Dracula, a story which everyone knows. Apparently the character of Lucy is based on Mercy. Dracula was published in 1897 and it's said that he was inspired by an 1896 article in the New York World about Mercy, but there is question over whether this leaves enough time for him to write an entire novel. Regardless of whether it was actually the Browns who inspired the story or not, he was definitely inspired by the folklore of vampires. Despite popular opinion, he did not come up with the idea of vampires they had been around for hundreds of years. But the New England Vampire Panic in general may have inspired him. Whilst the New England Vampire Panic is thought to have been caused by tuberculosis having the effect of sucking the life out of people, there's also a good argument to think that the legend of vampires who bite their victims and suck their blood may have actually come from rabies instead. Many of the characteristics of vampires as we know them today also appear as classic symptoms of rabies. People and animals with rabies have a tendency and need to bite others. Rabbids are also known to have a sensitivity to sunlight and an aversion to strong smells. We all know that garlic is said to be able to fend off vampires. People with rabies also often become hypersexual, and we all know that vampires in modern culture tend to be depicted as hypersexualized. I feel like The Vampire Diaries is a great example of this, but even back in the 30s and 40s when vampire movies were all the rage. People tend to think that vampire films and obsessions are a thing of the 2010s, but really, they've been a staple since the era of silent films. People have always had this fascination. By 2005, Dracula had been the subject of more films than any other fictional character, except for Sherlock Holmes. In early tests for rabies, people were not considered to be rabid if they could stand the sight of themselves in the mirror, and it's long been a vampire trope, they have no reflection. And vampires being nocturnal and never needing sleep, rabies causes pretty awful insomnia. So like I said, whilst this specific New England vampire panic was probably caused by fear and misunderstanding of tuberculosis, or as they called it, consumption, how it seemed like it sucked the lives out of victims, vampires as we know them today have probably been more strongly influenced by rabies. I don't want to sound like the massive nerd I am, but I love facts and stories like this. I will literally never watch the Vampire Diaries in the same way again. It's so interesting. All in all, the New England Vampire Panic was just families being desperate to save their loved ones. You think that something like this wouldn't happen nowadays, but people will go to any length to try and save the life of their child, or their mother, or their sibling. There's a chance that a lot of the people didn't even really believe in vampires, probably just a select few really believed in this folklore. But if there's a small chance that you can help your loved ones live, you're going to do it. So there we have it, the New England Vampire Panic, something I had never heard of before, and now I'm telling literally everyone who listens to me about it. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.